Lexical categories, parts of speech. Now, I would bet that when you were in elementary school or in secondary school, you were taught the parts of speech. You were taught what is a noun, a verb, an adjective, a preposition. I would further bet that you were taught it really poorly. Now, I don't want to cast shade on you, though, because I also bet that you learned it, that you are perfectly capable today of recognizing a noun from a verb and a verb from an adjective and an adjective from a preposition. So what I want to get at is why these definitions that you're given are bad and why they still work. So think about what your teacher taught you. They probably taught you for noun that a noun is a person, place, or thing. And then inevitably there's a smart kid in the class who says, well, what about thought? Isn't that a noun? And the teacher says, oh, yeah, okay, person, place, thing, or idea. And then you say, okay, what about happiness? Is, is that an idea? And the teacher thinks some more and says, okay, person, place, thing, idea, or emotion. And then you get to verb, and they say, okay, well, this is easy. Verbs are action words. And you say, oh, okay. So run is an action, so run is clearly a verb. And the teacher says, yep, yep, run's a verb. And you go, okay, so I'm gonna go for a run. And she says, no, oh, no, 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 no. No, in that case, it's, it's a noun. And you say, but that's not a person, place, thing, or idea, or emotion. That's an action. And then you say, well, you know, and what about seem? Isn't seem a verb? That's not an action. And, you know, it goes on like this. And, and the thing is that the definitions are inaccurate. They're just not good. And the reason that they're not good for nouns and verbs is because they're targeting the meaning. And that's not the way that language works, right? These words are defined this way syntactically. And in a previous video, I said that syntax is a meaningless study, right? And what I meant by that is that when we're studying syntax, we're not interested in the meaning, we're interested in the form and parts of speech are all about form. Now, the one place where I actually like how teachers teach the part of speech is prepositions. Often what a teacher will say is that a preposition is anything that a rabbit can do to a fence. The idea is that you've got this frame, the rabbit ran blank the fence. The rabbit ran to the fence. The rabbit ran under the fence. The rabbit ran over the fence. The rabbit ran by the fence, right? Now, all of those are prepositions. And notice you can't define preposition by targeting its meaning. You can only target its place in a sentence. And that's a much better way to define these terms. To summarize, because we're looking at lexical categories, parts of speech, syntactically, we shouldn't appeal to meaning. Instead, we should use formal tests, i.e. we should look at how the words behave. Items belong to a category because they all behave similarly and because either other items do not fit as comfortably in that category. What this means is that you already know the parts of speech because you know how to create sentences. And that's what parts of speech are all about, is having these categories that we use in our mental grammar rules for how to create sentences. So when your teacher teaches you that a noun is a person, place, or thing, you're not taking that literally. You're taking that as giving you some good exemplars. So what you understand from that is that girl, is a good noun. Kitchen is a good noun. Ball is a good noun. And once you have those three good exemplars, you can use those to come up with more and more and more. And we realize that if 
for example, girl is a noun, then run can also act like a noun, therefore it is a noun, in certain situations. So when you say, for example, running is fun, that is a noun. Or when you say, I'm going for a run, that is a noun, because it's filling the slot in the sentence that makes it a noun. When I was an undergrad, my advisor taught this class on syntax, and he said that he was going to teach us the two sexiest words of English. You can judge for yourself. The two words are paradigmatic and syntagmatic. And the meaning of these is the two types of tests that we as speakers of a language use to determine parts of speech. Therefore, linguists can use the same tests. So paradigmatic or morphological tests look at what sorts of inflectional affixes can attach to the words. In a previous video, I talked about what inflections are. Inflections are these affixes, in English typically suffixes, that attach to words to create different forms of the same word. So if we think about conjugating verbs, you add an S to make the third person singular present tense, run, runs. We add an UD to make it past tense, walk, walked, live, lived. And then we've got the ING to make it a present participle run, running, live, living, walk, walking. So if you can add those suffixes to a word, that's pretty good evidence that it's a verb. Likewise, if we can add an er or an ist to it, that's pretty good evidence that it's an adjective because we know that small is an adjective and we can make smaller and smallest, tall, taller, tallest, and so on. A syntagmatic test looks at where in a sentence or a phrase a word can appear. So that's kind of the fill in the blank example. If you've got a noun, you can say the blank is good. We know the ball can fit in there. We know girl can fit in there. We know we dog can fit in there. Therefore, thought is also a noun because all of those other things are nouns. Okay, so let's think about this from a verb point of, point of view, first of all. So we've got grin, talk, and loan. We've got grins, grinned, grinning. Talks, talked, talking. Loans, loaned, loaning. That's our paradigm. So each column represents a paradigm. That is where we get this idea of paradigmatic. Now, in some languages, this is a really good test. So if we look at Latin, for example, or Hungarian, these are languages that are highly inflectional. English, not so much. We don't have as many inflections, and so it's not as good of a test. For us, the syntagmatic test is better. So we've got syntagmatic tests for verbs. So for example, we've got the, the first one, and these are subtypes of verbs. So the first one is for transitive verbs. The girl blanked the cereal. The girl ate the cereal. The girl bought the cereal. The girl saw the cereal. The girl drank the cereal. The next one is for intransitive verbs. The dog farted, the dog barked, the dog slept, the dog walked. The next one is for sentential verbs. The scientist thought that he had an auger, auger, auger fetish. The scientist believed that he had an auger, auger fetish. The scientist argued that he had an auger, auger, auger fetish. Um, the last one is sort of an unusual one. These verbs tend to be a little bit slangy. They take as their subjects subordinate clauses. So you can say that, that Halloween is almost here rocks, that Halloween is almost here rules, that Halloween is almost here sucks. So now I'm just going to give you some exemplars for each part of speech, and I'm going to trust that with those exemplars you can figure out what else belongs in that part of speech. So noun, boy, dog, apple, mess, song. From there you can extrapolate that thought and entropy are both Nouns. Transitive verbs. These are verbs, and you may have been taught this in school, that take a, an object. So love, kick, buy, ride. They seem to need something after them to complete them. Right? I love my dog. I love this ice cream. A ditransitive verb is a verb that takes two objects, like 
tell my wife a joke give my dog a walk. so typically the first one is the indirect object, the second one is the direct object a sentential complement verb this is one that takes a subordinate clause, kind of ah an embedded sentence i think that my dog needs a walk i wonder whether my dog needs a walk an adjective we've got happy, tall, green, special as i talked about before, these you can add an er or an ist to in some cases, but not all you couldn't do that with special for example, specialer or specialist just doesn't sound right. So it's not a perfect test to use the paradigmatic one. Instead, we could put it in a blank, like the blank dog, the happy dog, the green dog, the special dog. An adverb, and this one is my least favorite because I consider it to be a wastebasket category. It's the category that linguists use when it doesn't fit in any other category. It's really hard to find a good frame for it, syntagmatic frame for it. There's no paradigmatic test for it. Um, I'm not really going to go into any great detail on adverbs in this lecture. Instead, just recognize slowly, unfortunately, very, tomorrow. These all count as adverbs. Don't be fooled. Don't think that all words that end in ly are adverbs, nor that all adverbs end in ly. Um, for example, we can give give lovely, which is clearly not an adverb, it's an adjective. You can say the lovely dog, and you can say lovelier, or loveliest. And then we also have very, which clearly doesn't end in an ly. Determiner, this is the term that linguists use. You might have been taught the term article. This refers to words like the and a uh, an. I consider that to be one word. It's just purely a phonological alternation there. It, if, it, if it precedes an, a vowel, then it's an. If it pre precedes a consonant, then it's a. We also have some, every, her. Notice that all of those fit the same frame. The dog, a dog, some dog, every dog, her dog. Preposition. We talked a little bit about one test for that. The rabbit ran blank the fence in, from, by. Notice that of doesn't fit in that frame, but I'm sure you can find a frame that demonstrates that it behaves similarly to other prepositions. Then there's conjunctions. Our best two exemplars are and and or. There are others in English like nor and for and so and but, but these are the best two. Then there's complementizer. That's the term that linguists use. You might have been taught that they're subordinating conjunctions. I hate that term because it suggests that they behave similarly to conjunctions, which just simply isn't true. Syntacti syntactically, they act very differently from conjunctions. So examples are because, if, although. So in sum, when we're looking at parts of speech, forget about the meaning. Focus on how they function syntactically, formally. Think about how they function in the paradigmatic sense and in the syntagmatic sense. That's how we figure out what part of speech it is. And most of the time, we do it by looking at a part of speech that we already know and see if it behaves similarly to that word.